Are you doing something beautiful with those, please? Oh, oh, nice. I like that. Use, use that same green on these three fish. James, you have, you have to put white dots on the tail. James, you gotta help me, James. You gotta help me. I'll put white dots.
think we'll get started soon. You want to get started, Kevin? Sure. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Our Art House is very grateful for Kevin Kogan's generosity, and we are so pleased to be sharing his presentation in the past, in the present, excuse me, looking to the past and back again. I'm Lila Voss, Art House's Executive Director, and Rebecca Kempton and Patricia Hughes, our Administrative Assistant and Development officer will also be keeping an eye on the chats and helping in any way that they can. About halfway through Kevin's talk, we will be taking a break during which he will field some questions and I will share information about Art House. In the chat, you will also find a link to donate. We will have more time to answer questions at the end and hopefully to engage in some informal discussion. In the meantime, please keep yourselves mute. Ever since Kevin graduated from Cooper School of Art, he has been actively shaping the art and culture landscape wherever he has gone. A tireless maker, the breadth of his work incorporates painting, print, performance, and installation. He is a founding member of alternative art venues like Spaces in Cleveland, Square Zero, and the Asheville Working Press in North Carolina. In addition, to his art practice, Kevin's career includes directing galleries, working as an art critic, teaching and lecturing at universities, galleries, museums, and art centers, such as the Innovation Institute at the McCall Center for Visual Arts. He exhibits extensively throughout the United States. You will also find his work in many national or international public and private collections and in at least seven print archives. When Kevin was 11, he emigrated from Liverpool, England and landed in Lakewood, Ohio. Although he has lived in Asheville, North Carolina since 1979, he has continued to have a close artistic relationship with Northeast Ohio, returning here often to create prints and other projects. Please welcome Kevin Hogan. Thank you very much, Lila. Um, I want to thank Lila and everybody at Art House for uh, allowing me to do this uh, again. Um, I, uh, you know, I have a strong connection to Cleveland, as many of you know, and um, I'm happy, always happy to go to Cleveland. With the pandemic, it's been a little difficult, um, and uh, so. This allows me to uh, reach out, um, share some different and um, more relevant uh, information, uh, and I deeply appreciate it. Um, one of the uh, work tasks that I have in front of me right now, or have had over the last six to eight months, has been the digitization of um, my image library. And I'm in the process of that. And there's a lot of that evident in, uh, in the presentation today, and it's ongoing. Um, I just wanna talk about that a little bit because I know a lot of you are makers and um, are of my generation um, and have had experience with slides, all the analog processes, then the process, the, you know, the development into um, film, four by fives, two and a quarters, and so forth, and then into the digital era. So um, if you're anything like me, you're kind of caught um, in a place where there's a lot of kind of backstepping and catch up, which is what I've been involved with. And I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation and answer any questions you may have, because I know uh, from personal experience, 
it's it's quite a task and um, technical and um, a roadmap is not a bad thing to have. Um, without a further ado, I'm just going to start this um, and I'm going to go to full screen uh, here in a second. Um, one of the things that's always been really good about um, giving this kind of presentation is that, uh, you know, one has to um, look back and evaluate the work. Um, I read somewhere the other day, I forget who said it, um, but it's, uh, it takes about 30 years to determine whether something is actually a piece of art. And um, I'm not sure that that's exactly true, but I, I do know that uh, that kind of period of time uh, for reflection um, on what you're doing is, uh, can be significant. And it's certainly the case with me. The drawing on the left was a drawing I made in 1970 at Lakewood High. And the drawing on the right is a drawing from 2013. Um, I was 17 years old and all I really cared about was drawing. Um, I met my wife while I made that drawing and um, that drawing is hanging in my house. Right after high school, um, it was a lot of um, rendering, drawing. I was thinking about being an illustrator. Um, these new works are, um, that's right up into last year at the 40 year anniversary at Spaces. A quick jump around just to get you a, a sense of how quickly and dramatically things have changed for me over this period of time. This is a charcoal drawing from the early 2000s. Um, again, this sort of limb form reoccurs. Uh, graphic structure is fundamental to me. And I resisted color for a long, long, long time. The drawing on the left is a charcoal drawing on paper from about 75. This is a print from um, uh, about 86. Drawings from the early 80s, pencil drawings. Small. 22 by 30. These were made when I first had any in pencil. Um, I had been inspired very much early on at, at the museum in Cleveland um, with Persian miniatures and this kind of um, hierarchical uh, graphic um, formula that was used. Um, and use the pyramid as a, uh, as, a, as a kind of an encapsulating element to uh, capture these industrial, agricultural, military, and um, sociopolitical motifs. Um, rather assertive, aggressive, strong drawing, um, uh, Headless, handless, footless figures um, um, of confinement, um, stress. This is a combination image that was generated out of my experience as a drummer and a linebacker. Um, <laughs> this stance sort of reflects um, This multi-appendage uh, stance reflects both, uh, both activities. Um, this is um, a screen print and drawing that 
uh, was generated at Brand X Editions in 1984 in New York with Tom Little, um, who was one person who got me uh, involved initially in Silkscreen. He's no longer with us, but was a master printer in, um, in New York for, for many years. Another charcoal drawing, uh, spill drawings. Again, the headless, headless uh, figures submerged in, um, in a flood and a spill. Um, and these, these drawings are from the late 80s. Um, almost looking a little prophetic these days. Um, this is a detail of, uh, of another large drawing, working out imagery. Um, it's kind of the era of the new imagists. And um, I was highly influenced by not only the stuff I was seeing at the museum, but also stuff that was coming out of Chicago, uh, Jim Nutt, Roger Brown, people like that. Well, that went quick. Um, um, this is another big uh, charcoal drawing, probably 82 by 60. Again, from the early 80s, um, we were living out in the country um, and I was trying to get some kind of um, sense of identity in my new environment. Um, broken down fences, female figures at work or in despair, male figures dominating um, in, in control. Um, this is um, an image from a, um, a performance um, that I did with a group of people, Level Evil in Cleveland in 1991, I believe. Um, we'll come to more of that. Um, I'm always doing drawings. This is a burning bridge drawing, char uh, marker on paper, just quick sort of stuff, generating ideas sort of ongoing, doing this sort of thing all the time. Um, back to that drawing, a small print, looking again at this sort of branch form and how the branch form leads to ideas for construction and sculpture and three-dimensional uh, objects for performance actions. Bridge drawing again. Um, I think that uh, drawing is fundamental and it's always been a part of, of uh, my practice. Here you can see a little bit more action on the, this was a piece that was based on, on, on uh, oil spills. And we constructed a, a major apparatus that created a kind of spill in the parking lot of the Cleveland Public Theater. He is the victim, the one who blames. This is from a major show I did at uh, the Mint Museum in 92, I believe. Um, big charcoal drawing, 60 by 60, framed with text underneath. Another one following up. He is the victim, the one who blames. She carries the seed. He is the source of the spill. She keeps the fire. Um, these were shown um, in a, in a for me, a major uh, one person exhibition uh, at the Mint Museum in Charlotte. And this, this one gives you a sense of the installation, um, which was interesting. Um, they had to be framed. So we put them on the wall with, with a great deal of help from Dan Gottlieb, who was, at the, who was the proprietor preparator at that time at the Mint. He's now at um, the North Carolina Museum. And we basically painted a square on the wall, packed the drawings up, and then put a plexiglass, wooden frame plexiglass over the top of it, then the text below, to create this reflection. So you're looking at one drawing and seeing the drawing across the gallery reflected in the plexiglass as well. He is the consumer, she is the worker. 
Another one um, without the uh, plexi, he is the violent container. She is the victim, the one who mourns. And this, this is, I like to put in installation, exhibition installation shots a lot because it, it actually, I, I was kind of surprised that I even had this slide, but this will give you an idea how um, things can get totally thrown out of context. That um, the previous slides, I think, looked really gritty and grimy, rough and hard. And then this looks extremely elegant. I think a lot of times um, content and subject matter maybe is missed when the environment, the environment of the exhibition is so overwhelming. Um, but it goes to show that an institution cares um, and is willing to put themselves kind of out on a limb I mean, you can see over to the left, some kind of, you know, objects in, in the uh, furniture gallery over there. Um, at any rate, it's, um, that, was a, that was a very uh, um, enlightening and rewarding experience. Um, it was the first of a series that the Mint started called Art Currents. Um, it, it, it uh, was a, as a wonderful experience, great people there. Um, this is a, a print going back to uh, the, uh, the level evil piece. Going through some This is a piece that I did in Cologne, um, uh, probably 92, I believe. Um, I was invited to go over there and, and do a piece, do an exhibition at uh, uh, BBK, which is the Berufsverband Bildender Kunstler, which is sort of like the, the city art house. And um, I shipped all these wooden uh, objects over and with a great deal of help and then uh, installed, went over for a couple of weeks, installed it and did these wall drawings um, as, uh, um, as part of it. I had been doing a considerable amount of wall drawing at that time, uh, charcoal directly on the wall and again, it, it requires a significant amount of tolerance and trust and permission on the part of the um, institution because you're, I mean, it's a lot of work to get the walls back. This is coal on the floor. They were very particular about how I got the coal. The Germans are, are wonderful people and very particular and very concerned about everybody doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I, I will take a um, kind of a local look. So I stayed on, I, they put me up in this hotel and I was overlooking the river, the Rhine, it's a big river. And the barges were going by back and forth, back and forth all the time, all the time. So that element, um, was incorporated along with a, a covered load on a tractor trailer that um, I've used in the past, which is over on the right, the barge uh, bow, I suppose, on, on the front with this um, Cleveland mechanisms um, is what I call it, which initially inspired by how roll steel used to be transported around town in Cleveland. Um, a kind of a balancing act going on here um, that, again, this is 1990. I don't know 
I really don't know how hard people were thinking about these issues at that time. Um, they certainly are now. This is the other side. And again, I, I have sort of, uh, in Western North Carolina, been exposed to an, a very interesting sort of agricultural structure that was initially based on tobacco, which is largely gone, um, but a new kind of sustainable um, local produce uh, efforts at, at work now, which is very encouraging. Certainly wasn't going on uh, back then. Um, I go back to this, this uh, level evil um, spill station, fill station is what it was called. And the level evil thing was a, a, um, a, a turn of phrase on Cleveland Asheville. Um, so uh, Cleveland was level. Is that right? And Asheville was evil, level evil. And it was about, you know, this absurdity of um, the spilling of resources to the dire consequences that we suffer for, from Exxon Valdez, for instance, which happened, I think, after this. Um, but the idea basically was that there were two primary performers one was drilling holes in this container, uh, causing it to spurt and spill. And this guy had a hammer around his neck and was plugging holes um, as um, the sort of electronic music thing was going on, as well as um, an occasional burst of screaming rabbits, if you can imagine that. Um, we had managed to find ourselves it's a, a recording of screaming rabbits, that baby rabbits that they, they play for dogs to get them riled up to hunt rabbits, which is disturbing. And the sound was very disturbing. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a very dark, rough, tough piece. Uh, but people responded really well to it. And... Um, the visuals are, are pretty interesting. This is a print uh, from about the same period, print collage, which again, I, in, upon reflection, um, it's from the Shooting Victim series. And this is from 1988. And I'm not sure what kind of shootings were going on, but it was a, um, it was a common theme for me at that time. And you can see that the figure, the truncated, headless, handless figure is becoming more abstract. It's more of a torso than a figure. And eventually, the, what I call the Cleveland mechanism and the torso sort of merged. And, you know, one of the great things in art history is in the 20th century, the great theme is man and machine. So I thought I was appropriately addressing that issue uh, towards the end of the 20th century. And um, I began to introduce more color because printmaking, particularly through silkscreen, um, just seemed like a logical way to apply color. I never felt very comfortable with a brush. Um, seeing the results of my own hand, always wanting to sort of take my hand out of it. It's almost impossible, but um, I was working at it. Um, here's another one where you can see the figural element a little bit more. Um, the arms becoming sort of um, ham shafts or mechanical parts integrated with the Cleveland mechanism. This is, um, I was making these at uh, the Intaglio Relief Society uh, in Asheville, Forge Buck ran that, um, ran that shop. 
and um, I was using spent aluminum plates, spent aluminum litho, commercial litho plates. I was cutting them out into the shape of the mechanism. And then I was inscribing it um, with a stylus, with a super fine line, and then rolling it and printing it, rolling it, printing it again, much like I do in my regular printmaking practice, which is a kind of print it once, then flip it over, print it again, so you get a mirrored image. And the plate becomes a, um, an offset litho plate um, so that this area of the main kind of rounded corner figure is printed twice. In the lighter areas, it's just printed once. This is again, a, a shooting victim in a spill. Another one we looked at earlier. The prints developed into the drawings. Um, Very nice coal they've got in Germany. The figural stuff, and, and I, you know, it's interesting, I uh, got into a discussion with somebody the other day about the difference between figural and figuration, uh, which I'm still a little confused about, but I'm thinking about. And um, I do a lot of watercolors pretty regularly, um, both within the context and narrative of my own work and as um, what I call postcard watercolors where I just wherever we go or may go I don't really go to the beach or anything I kind of stick around and, and make watercolors um, this is a, um, a watercolor from 2002 I did a whole series of them where this sort of the internals of the figure are exposed uh, organs, for lack of a better term, the mechanics of the body. Um, and also, obviously, you exploring the wet on wet media and, and just the palette. And I think that that's an important thing to probably talk about now is, the, is kind of a transition where um, content, subject, um, a message, something I'm trying to tell people um, really doesn't um, carry, carry the day as much as um, an aesthetic pursuit. So this is a relief print made at Kent State, I think, and in, uh, in 2012, um, Printed probably four times, five times, um, two, three different plates, um, intaglio and relief, 12 by 12. So there's this sort of ongoing battle that I have between um, aesthetic pursuits and trying to make something that, that's relevant. Um, and I think what comes to mind for me is some important quote that I, that I remember from, um, uh, oh gee, I'm, now I'm forgetting the artist, um, abstract expressionist, and he, uh, Motherwell, Robert Motherwell, and I, 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 I like his work, there are things that I don't like about his work, things I love about his work, but he said something I think is really important for 20s, late 20th century artists, I think, particularly. And that is that the, the challenge to a contemporary artist um, is to model the world, model the new world that um, 
that new science, new philosophy, astronomy, astrophysics, all those things that bring extraordinary information uh, to our dialogues, to our discourse. And um, I believe artists have to address that. And, and it's difficult. Some people do it representationally. Um, I'm trying to do it more regularly in an abstract way. Um, one of the things I really like about abstraction is that it, it does, it's not a one-liner. It keeps, it keeps talking to you, it, it's, particularly if you live with it. Um, so with that slide, I'm just gonna, we're gonna take a break because I'm going about 90 miles an hour. And I, I know um, we want to take a little break, have a look at the chat and see if there are any questions. And I think Lila is going to talk a little bit about Art House, as I should as well. Um, you know, as Lila mentioned earlier on, um, I've always been involved with stuff. I, uh, I Cooper, I was, you know, at Lakewood High School, I was involved in student politics. At Cooper, as, you, as much as you could be in those days, I was involved with, uh, with the culture and the social aspects of the school. It was a wonderful place. Any of you who know or were aware of it at the time. And um, I've always believed in these sort of grassroots uh, approaches. One of the great things um, about my experience in Asheville is that in now 40 years, um, we've seen a tremendous development in, um, in, the, in certain areas, but um, we enjoy a fabulous museum now. We have literally hundreds of artists who are working regularly and uh, in all kinds of uh, areas. We have an extraordinary glass community, an extraordinary contemporary crafts community and a growing um, contemporary art community. Mel Chin lives in the neighborhood. He's great. There are all kinds of uh, interesting things going on. Um, art House to me represents that kind of building kind of community building that's so essential um, and I think is grassroots. Um, and um, that's why I support um, such a place. Um, I know what it's like to um, feel like you have something but not, um, not having the resources. Um, to make it happen and um, an open door is, uh, is critical to many people's lives, particularly young people. So um, I would encourage you all, particularly those in Cleveland and more everybody um, to support our house. With that, I'm gonna um, give it over to anybody who might have a few questions or we'll just keep going. What the, what's going on, Lila? Are you there? I'm I'm here. Uh, I just uh, sometimes my internet is a little <laughs> so I uh, have been trying to turn off my video to see if that helps. So um, I don't think that there are any questions in the chat. Kevin, do you want to just open it up to, for people to ask questions out loud to see if there are any or you're, you're sure. I'm just going. I'm looking at it now. Somebody's asking me to. Um, did you continue to run the museum hall to soak it all in? Any favorites? Um, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I don't get out that much <laughs> uh, with the pandemic, but um, I have been going um, to the Asheville Art Museum. I, I. Um, I look forward to, I, you know, what's happened at the Cleveland Museum is absolutely remarkable. Um, the Transformer Station, um, there are all kinds of things um, 
uh, going on in places that were, um, you know, cultural deserts, I suppose you might say. Um, I'd say that about Liverpool too, the Northern Tate in Liverpool. I'd certainly encourage everybody to, if you uh, get to the UK, um, fabulous museum, fabulous collection. Um, Atlanta, the High Museum has developed significantly over the last um, 20 years or more. The North Carolina Museum of Art, um, which, you know, uh, I should bring something up. Let me see if I can get to it. Uh, I have done a few things there. Um, This is a, I don't know if you can see that. You gotta share it. If it's on your desktop, you have to share it. Okay, uh, let me see if what I can do to that. Uh, um, this is a, um, uh, this is a major consumer and wall walkers um, on the top of the wall at the entrance to the North Carolina Museum from, um, I think maybe in 89 or I, I can't remember exactly. Um, but directly above the entrance. Uh, and, you know, that's a remarkable story where the state, it is a state collection, which is unusual. Um, and um, they have expanded dramatically from when this photograph was taken um, to a, a basically a campus, which is a huge uh, interior and exterior, uh, that's a better shot, um, a huge interior and exterior campus uh, that is, it, you know, it, if I have any issue, I would say that they, you know, it's, it may be a little too comprehensive. Um, it is, you know, they, they show everything. They collect everything, which is a huge uh, tall order these days, but they still have the time and the money to do stuff like this. Not so much anymore, but they used to. Um, this was curated by a, uh, uh, a guy from, uh, Stephen Westfall, a guy from uh, Bard, who, uh, let me see if I can find something else that, uh, that relates. Um, you know, yeah, I should, let me go back to, let's see. Um, this is um, the elevator at the Asheville Art Museum, um, or, sh or should I say a, a rendition of the elevator at the Asheville Art Museum. They asked me um, when they opened up the new space if I would do something in the elevator, and it sounded like a major challenge and an opportunity to me. Uh, I like the challenge. Um, the image in the center is actually a, a, a preliminary um, Photoshop file for what you're looking at, which is a, a printed substrate um, mounted on the panels uh, that are the elevator. It was um, generated from existing imagery through Photoshop um, uh, then printed digitally. Um, these panels are 94 by 32 inches each. 
and um, it's um, it's it's quite something. I, I I was very happy with the result. I worried about it. Didn't tell any. Didn't really tell anybody about it um, until it was up. And um, people really like it, which is great. Not that it really matters that much to me, but um, I was very happy with it. And the staff at the museum uh, were remarkable in, in every detail because it, um, it wasn't an easy install. It's like taking, um, you know, like contact cement and, um, and um, two highly sticky surfaces and putting them together perfectly at just the right time. Um, and it's been up over a year now. I, they made a, they, I actually gave it to them. Um, so they're, they, they could print it. Uh, they could print it any size, I suppose. Or something happened to this, they could redo it. It's holding up really well, though. So that's kind of, you know, that, that's happening. Um, Museum wise, um, for me, I last year I was supposed to go to England and go to a place called the um, uh, oh geez, um, the Blue Coat Art Center, the oldest art center in the United Kingdom. And um, I was going to do some printing. Um, it's in Liverpool. And the pandemic happened. So I'm still uh, waiting on that. We'll see what happens. Um, but um, let me go here. This is a, this is a representation. Um, to, the origins of this are a rather large, a huge, uh, Photoshop file, multiple, multiple, multiple layers um, to achieve this kind of this density, and then of course with any kind of printing, it's it's extremely dependent on who's printing it, what kind of machine you're printing it on, and um, so it you know it's um, it's it's to some degree an experimentation. And you have to be sort of tolerant and willing to um, to go with the flow and work collaboratively, which is not always the easiest thing, but can be very productive. I was ultimately very happy with it. Um, the uh, the interesting thing, I think, to me, as much as anything else. I thought it's it's a big elevator, but I thought it might be too claustrophobic with stuff like this happening in it all the time. So the upper panels are a little bit more open and reflect nicely the ceiling lighting to create a kind of an infinity thing at the top. Um, so with that, that's a little jump ahead, but I, people too seem to like the jumping around kind of stuff. Um, I wanted to go back. Let me go, I'll just start it up again right here. So this is, uh, um, uh, a, do we have another, or do we have another question? I'm sorry. Uh, well, do you want to start your presentation again or should I do my little spiel? Or do you want to wait? Oh. Well, I, I'm happy to do that. Um, you you kind of, you're breaking up a little bit, am I? Can anybody uh, respond to that? Yeah, okay. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. I was just asking if I should do uh, give my art house information at this point, or 
if you want to just change the format. No, that's fine. I'm happy to do that. We okay. should probably do that. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> okay. And I will. I will stop. Can I, I'm going to stop sharing. Is that wise? Yes, you have to. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. I will. <laughs> I'm not sure I can, can I? I already did it. Let's see. Oh, okay. You did it for me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So our house uh, got started about 21 years ago by artists and neighbors in Brooklyn Center. They uh, firmly believe that art is critical to human development and also to build stronger neighborhoods. We uh, fulfill our mission, which is to inspire expression and exploration through the visual arts by creating access to professional instruction, uh, quality materials and equipment. Most of our programming is free. Oh, there we go. So since 2002, Art House has been conducting urban bright arts and education programs in school and after school. They are pretty extensive explorations into different materials and ideas recycled plastics and so on. The artists are from a diverse background and from a, and have many skills and are very versatile. Uh, it, it is really true that art does transform lives. Uh, a, a kindergartner after a printmaking residency exclaimed that this was what he was born to do. High school students have gone on to join Habitat for Humanity after doing a program in which they learned how to construct uh, furniture, functional furniture out of cardboard, paper, and string. Uh, the, we also work with a variety of themes. One of them has been the art of democracy through the Creative Fusion Project. We introduce stewardship and biomimicry concepts into the programs. We are very uh, fortunate to be one of the organizations to host a Cleveland uh, Foundation F Creative Fusion Artist. This one is Anna Kiros, and she is now working at Thomas Jefferson uh, International, which is a transitional school for refugees and immigrants. Uh, and this is a... Um, memory atlas workshop. We also started doing art camps last year during the pandemic. It's an initiative that we are continuing and planning on growing. And we partner with other organizations. One of them is the Comité Mexicano uh, to provide workshops at our facility in which people learn more about Mexican cultural traditions. We also have a regular uh, series of family studios, uh, clay and many other kinds of materials and projects monthly and bi-monthly. We host exhibitions. This is one that we mount. We usually mount a yearly urban bright exhibition when uh, provided there's no pandemic. Uh, we also have been fortunate to be able to host uh, ambitious exhibitions like this. This was the Sustainable Art of Plastics and, and it actually began as an Urban Bright program that one of our artists was doing and it, it grew into a huge project that included international, national and local artists. We also do programs like the Inventory Challenge where emerging and established artists come together at Art House and uh, rummage through our inventory and create art that often is in, outside of their normal box. The Community Culture Night includes artists and other creative professionals. This was a hybrid uh, event 
in which uh, Chris and Bob also uh, did an improv with the electronic music that they do make individually and as a team. Uh, we started doing a free art kit distribution once the schools closed down and children and youth were being isolated. And this is a, a project that we are continuing to do this year. And uh, we are fortunate to be realizing a, a vision for Art House's campus. We are moving forward on raising the funds to create a creative garden that will be an outdoor classroom. It will be a resource for the neighborhood. It will beautify our street, which has become even more important, uh, hopefully in a post pandemic world. And that is it. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? I'm happy to answer. Okay. <laughs> Kevin, I think you're back on. Okay, hold on a sec. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, let's go back again just look at some paintings and drawings maybe for a little while. This is a small painting, relatively recent, uh, maybe two, 2012, 2011, small painting, probably about 14 inches square um, from af the After Lucas series. Um, and I, I mentioned that um, because I wanted to, uh, talk about people, you know, there's so little time, so much to talk about. Um, but I, in, in Cleveland and in Northern Ohio, um, I was so fortunate to meet so many remarkable people in the Lakewood School System, at Cooper School of Art, at the Institute, at the museum, and all over, uh, at Kent. I went to Kent for graduate school to work with Craig Lucas. So glad I did. He was never on the graduate faculty, um, but we became great friends and he was a huge influence on me. Um, and I loved him dearly and admired his work very much. And anybody who knows Craig's work can see the influence here. Um, he understood color, color like I, I, I don't, um, or maybe I'm working on it. He's... Um, uh, he said something to me that I'll never forget. Color has a way of spreading. Simple enough, but brilliant. And um, it does. Um, and it's containing it that becomes the issue very often. Um, very often I choose to contain it this kind of way. This is small ink and uh, watercolor drawing. Um, Painting brings a lot of challenges. This is a big painting, like 70, what is it, 72 inches square. Um, if, you, if you're gonna make paintings, at some point you gotta make big paintings. That's just, that's, it's, a, it's a problem that my generation has. And I, it, it used to be that you would make a big painting because nobody could hang it in their house. And it, it was, or this used to, it was among some people was a sort of a stratagem um, that it would have to, it would have to go to the public uh, venue, you know, um, but that's all changed. Um, but for me, it's a kind of a, um, it's like the elephant in the room. If, you, if you're not done it, I don't know. It's like printmaking. If you're not working on a big sheet of paper, I'm, I'm not sure what you're doing. Or you, you've got to work on a big, you got to handle a big sheet of paper, even if you're doing, I do small stuff and big stuff, but I think Working a range of scale is uh, is an important challenge that should be met. 
Here's another one, same size, big painting. And this is interesting because it sort of develops into some of the broader strategies. I, uh, this is done by hand, painted. I like the paintings very much, but there's something that, um, uh, that I like about the mechanical uh, as well. And I spoke earlier about wanting to get my hand out of the um, pretty expressive, but the hand is evident. Um, and I, I worked on various ways to become more mechanical. And I'll show you some of that in a little while. Um, this is, uh, we're going back now, we're jumping around. I like to jump around. Um, this is from a piece I did in graduate school at Kent, 49 linear operations. Um, and I built a room with two light boxes and I'd found these old carbon paper, uh, a carbon paper pad and I made drawings on them. I tore, separated them. These are the drawings on the back. And then the carbon papers I put in plastic envelopes that you could layer inside these light boxes. And you would go in the room and play around on your own for a little while and then leave and turn the lights out. Um, it was pretty interesting wanting to get the hand out of it to the point where you let other people make the decisions about what you're doing. Um, uh, a combination of print and drawing. Uh, going back to this again, because of this um, truncated figural element, mechanical, and uh, again, the fire. And for me, a lot of that is a, it's a sort of an, it's a combination of an, like an industrial fire and a, and a natural fire, uh, something to be embraced and something to be feared. Um, this is a small print I made when I got back from um, a residency I did in France, and um, in the south of France. And I wanted to I wanted to uh, pick up new imagery, right? So the image on the left and right are kind of uh, uh, beach, like beach natural beach trash, like pieces of uh, not really coral but uh, sea plants. Um, basic, fundamental, kind of universal. Um, and I've continued to use those in, uh, in different ways. This is another print from a little bit later, 95, 96. This is actually, uh, was made at the Lower East Side Print Shop in New York. Um, they used to have a program where they would commission artists to come and work in residency and they had to make a series of prints um, on handmade paper. Um, and then they could do, you know, use their extra time to do whatever they wanted. Um, this I believe is one on handmade paper and, and is in their archive. Um, again, it's, uh, it's underlying silk screen. You can see a kind of a, a base linear matrix um, that was silk screened at Brand X. And then all the rest of the color, this linear pattern, the elements in the center um, were printed uh, with etched zinc plates. And then a, combina a combination of block outs um, that then again are used as um, offset litho plates as they gather ink and become the, the block outs gather ink and become plates themselves. So these sort of subtle variations in these areas, that's how they're generated. Um, you know, that sort of complexity of space has always been a fascination of mine. Um, out of really uh, kind of out of surrealism and to some extent, op art, 
I, I loved Larry Poons talking about the Cleveland Museum of Art back in the old days when they didn't have much of anything in terms of 20th century art. They had a couple of brilliant Larry Poons that were very influential on me. And um, this is a detail from a larger painting um, that's actually in the collection at the Asheville Art Museum. And these, this is getting really close to actual size, a little smaller maybe. You can see the, the texture of the canvas. Um, and it's a very simple, um, non-arithmetic, if I could say that, application of a dot matrix in essentially primary colors. Um, which is the way I work. Even in watercolor, I jet my palette, generally speaking, almost without um, exception, uh, is uh, process colors. Obviously diluted, overlaid, but process color nonetheless. This is another big painting, um, relatively recent. Um, I think it's the title is the Asheville uh, Garden of Earthly Delights, something like that. And here you can see again where I'm, you know, talking about these uh, ellipses. These ellipses were generated um, by hand. Um, These ellipses were generated by um, my ellipse mechanism, which I built um, to draw uh, big ellipses on the wall and uh, on canvas. I'll show you some of that stuff later. Um, this, this is kind of an interesting slide because I, um, Again, as I said earlier, I always go back to drawing. And in the background here, let me see if I can. No, I can't do that. Yeah, I go, yes, I can. Um, that'll give you an idea of the scale. At one point, sometimes I'll just um, I'll sit down and I'll lay down a hundred sheets of paper and I'll make drawings on them until I'm done. And this is what I did here. This is the flux mix vocabulary, and I think there are. Um, 100 drawings here, maybe 200 drawings, I'm not sure. At any rate, um, it's sometimes I, I have to go back to fundamentals um, to, to get through it, you know, to, to work through uh, problems of uh, scale and application or whatever. This is another big painting. And you can see to some extent where the drawing is applied to the larger scale work articulated differently, but the structure is there. And I think that, um, again, it's fundamental. I, I'm not, um, I don't want it to be, I want it to kind of look exotic, but easy to read in the sense that the space is evident and the shapes are not alien in any way. Um, it's just, it's, it's in, invoking things that you may not be um, familiar with, but there's nothing in the composition that's unfamiliar. And that's the wonder of abstraction. So is it micro, is it macro? Um, I, I love that kind of, um, back and forth, a kind of an internal spatial dialogue, trying to grasp the eye just cannot resist trying to figure out where it is. Um, and I, that's what I love about, about abstraction in the broadest sense. Um, I'm gonna jump real quick to something that's relative. It's very recent. This is actually something I'm working on right now. And this is a digital, this is a, um, I'm calling them digital maps, essentially. And this 
this is from a very, very um, uh, large digital capture of an existing print, um, then put into Photoshop and worked so that there are, I mean, there'd be three or four um, layers to this for those of you who are familiar with Photoshop. Most of it's in one layer, but this white ellipse here is, is revealing um, much of what its original state was as a silk screen on top of an intaglio relief. Um, but in its digital form, it's, you know, it's transformed, uh, translated. Um, and I find that absolutely fascinating um, and um, new territory to be able to be working on at this late stage in, in my life. Um, another big painting, uh, seven, I think they're 76 inches square, those big paintings. Um, another digital map, all in the computer right now. But you can see that this flame element on the left, that's, that's from a print. All of the all of these elements were um, were sourced in uh, in prints, um, which is kind of an ongoing discussion right now. And it may be some interest to you. And I think what's emerging and what people are telling me is that if it's exclusively generated in the computer, it's digital. So I'm not sure what this is. That's why I call it digital mapping. Um, this is also digital mapping, but this is printed on plexiglass and there are two layers. And this, this is another crazy one. Um, I have actors who, here in town who, uh, one of them is also a maker. And my wife and I really like his work. And so I said, you know, we really like this new work. Do you think we could make a trade? He said, but that'd be great. So I picked, he said, pick something out. And I said, and then you can come to the studio. So he came, they came to the studio and they have already got a lot of work, but we started talking. I went to the house and it ended up that we were going to do a railing, a new railing for them. So this is Four pieces of plexiglass sandwiched between four pieces of glass. The plexiglass is printed on three sides to create these um, translucent, transparent um, screens, for lack of a better term. Well, they loved the work, and, and I sweated it. I Until it got in, I, I, I really... I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but it turned out beautifully. Um, the ladies at uh, uh, Iron Maiden Studios in town did the did the frame, which is quite nice, white powdered steel, powder coated steel. But at any rate, they decided to move like within twelve months. It was like, ah oh, man, what? So and they were wanted to take it with them, and we designed it so that they could in that eventuality, take it, but we didn't think it would happen so quickly. So it ended up here. <laughs> so these, this is their new house and these are um, framed and um, mounted kind of like screens at the tops of the windows. And um, we talked and talked about this. I think they were, they were very, kind and forthcoming and generous and supportive and you know we don't want to do anything you don't like or you know and I, I said oh, this is great and I my ideas were probably a little too crazy but one of the things that I discovered in looking at the prototype and I this goes back to my days at Kent at AV Warehouse is that um, light is a beautiful thing and does things to translucent transparent things that you'd never imagine 
So this is what it looks like at night with a um, some security light or something at the neighbor's house. And the plexi is catching the light. So this, all, this also gets animated. And I think if I can try, let me see if I can do this. Can you see that? Well, let me see, I'm not sure. I have a little movie here somewhere. Let me see if I can get it. Yeah, here we go. Can people see that? Nod your head if you can. All right. <laughs> I love that. So if you can imagine if they were car lights or um, any kind of motion light on the on the back, it becomes like an, an, an animation. Um, and I finish on this, or I want to talk about this at the end, M more importantly to say, you know, after such a long time working, and I tell you, um, digitizing images and going through what I've worked on over the last 50 years is, um, is quite a task and, and quite uh, revealing and um, at sometimes sobering and sometimes I just want to take a rest. Um, but there's always something to work on. And um, I'm really excited about that stuff. I'm very happy that these guys have um, have found so much joy in something that really emerged from um, a collaboration between a collector and maker. Um, I think that's a great thing. Um, let me go back here and I'll show you, this is, this is the Photoshop file for what we were just looking at. And like the first thing you say is, oh, it's just, there's so much color. Well, again, it's, it's, it's understanding the application and how it is to be printed, so forth and so on. Um, so that the relative high key color is misleading. Um, because the way uh, that it's printed um, is such that um, it's knocked back, I would say 70%, which I'm totally aware of, but it's a difficult thing to work through and a difficult thing to, um, to communicate um, to people who are interested in pursuing what you're doing. Um, <laughs> this is uh, going back to, this is probably, 19, this is 1970, oh geez, 1978. Um, one of the first pieces, maybe the first piece I did at A space, P space, which became spaces. And this was a, a performance action and installation um, I did when they, when they were, well, we were first getting it going on Playhouse Square. And, um, again, I, you know, just kind of want to talk a little bit about how important it is to see the value of fledgling activity. Um, somebody gave James Rosenberger and the rest of us this space basically for nothing. It was a kind of a cavernous two floor space on Playhouse Square. Number one Playhouse Square, I guess it was, I can't remember. 
at any rate, um, it was fabulous. Um, and it became Spaces. And Spaces has been there now 40 years. Um, and this is part of a piece that I did at Spaces uh, for their 40th year anniversary. One small part of it. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a very personal uh, image. It's, um, it's 1359 Bell Avenue um, where I lived with my family, my mother and father, my sister in high school. Um, and the first couple of years, well, all of art school, I guess, at Cooper. And um, the little attic window, that was my studio. And uh, it was very precious to me. And all of the things that um, I was given by the people of Lakewood um, were very precious to me. Um, this is carved. Um, plaster, a gold leaf, and a handmade um, oak frame um, as part of a larger installation that um, as we wind down, I'll show you some more pictures of. But I think I'm going to end on that. And it's now uh, 324. I've gone on way too long. Um, and haven't shown you nearly all that I wanted to, but we can solve some of that here in a minute. But um, I would like to just end by thanking everybody who's uh, taken the time on a Saturday afternoon to do this. Um, and um, I do deeply appreciate it. And uh, it will, it has been recorded, I believe. Um, and there will be more like this. Um, as hard as I try to make them comprehensive, I always fall short. And I apologize for that. Um, if anybody is interested directly in the work, um, you can contact me. Um, Lila has my contact info. This is not a sales opportunity, but. You never know what happens with these things. It's not a, um, it's not an attempt to um, promote the work, but to show the work and express my affection for Northern Ohio as it is. Um, so with that, um, I am going to continue to share my uh, screen for about five or 10 minutes and throw up a few things and um, take any questions or um, criticisms, um, whatever you got. I see some friendly faces out there, <laughs> um, but uh, Thank you again for coming. And um, Lila, are you on the chat or am I, can people hear me? Can I hear people? Uh, yeah, I see. we can unmute everyone. See if people want to actually talk. Oh, okay. Well, that sure, that would be fine. And oh, can I continue to share my screen? Is that possible? Yeah. Okay. I'm still sharing Good. it. Oh, All right. All right, I'll, uh, I'll just do that. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to ask a question, uh, just unmute yourself and uh, go at it. Anybody got a question? So, Kevin, I have a question. Oh, it's Jim McCarthy. You've <laughs> <laughs> Jim, how are you? Yeah, it's so good to see you and, and thank you so much. Um, you know, here's the question, and you and I go back a long ways, and in some ways, I'm dealing with a little bit of the same dilemma you're, work, you're doing, which is how much time to give to the old work and kind of um, consolidating it, making sense out of it, and yet 
continuing to do the new work. And I, I'm curious if you feel a tension between those two activities, because I'm sure both you and I could spend the rest of our days digitizing the old work and consolidating it. But then there's that nagging feeling, shouldn't I be working on something new? So how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, thank you. Excellent question, Jim. Thank you. Um, it is a dilemma. And, and um, I have a note here somewhere um, that I, I thought, uh, you know, all that stuff, the past present that was down last night, the, the dilemma of identity. Um, and I think that that's, you know, fundamentally, that's what the art game is really all about. I think it's somebody who really knows art really well and artists extremely well said to me a couple of months ago, and I can't shake it. He works with as many big time artists as anybody I know. And he said, most artists don't know themselves. <laughs> Which I think is a really uh, brutal observation, but so true. And um, another one that I really like, and I use a lot. Not, yeah, they know. I, I, what, another one I really like is um, you can't you can't hit a moving target. So um, I I mean it's I can't stop working. I'm working. I work today on I'm working on watercolors, um, but I have been absolutely consumed by this for about two months, and I have probably digitized. Um, I'm approaching maybe 600 slides. Um, it, it, and it's been such a revelation. I mean, I had, I'm looking at stuff like this, right? Where's, uh, like this is the back of an installation at C Mocha in 1990, which was one of the great spaces, oh, art spaces in Cleveland. Um, and I didn't even know I, I didn't even know I had that slide. Um, I, I, I think, well, my, part of my problem uh, it, relative to that, uh, Jim, is that I have children. I now have grandchildren. Um, I have, I have, to, I'm, I'm approaching 70. I have to uh, get a handle on it because I've had a lot of good friends that have passed who, who made no attempt or for one reason or other could not get things in order um, to really horrible consequences for the work, the legacy, the whole nine yards. I mean, and so for me, going back again to that, to that statement about, you know, it takes 30 years really to determine whether anything's any good or not. And I believe that that's essentially true. Yeah. Um, that you just, you know, um, you've got, to, you've, and, and plus this extraordinary um, innovation in technology. So that yeah. those old slides, like some of these, some of these images we're looking at were for, are from slides from night that were taken in 1973. And I've had them laying around um, for almost 50 years. I wasn't taking slides in high school, but I was taking photographs. You were taking photographs of stuff and of me relatively soon out of me get, after getting out of high school. I mean, there's, a, and so, well, what was, what was all that? And um, why is it still hanging around? Well let's have a look and see. So now, you know, I have been encouraged and prodded to do a website. I've never done a website. It'll probably take me another six months to figure that out exactly. But um, there's stuff like this. This, I really, <laughs> can you see that? Nope. <laughs> 
<laughs> this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is from this is from the um, this is from the late '80s, and it was a campaign to raise money for my flight to Germany for that show in Germany, and um, you know, it's to, I I like it, and um, I like the sentiment, I like the phrase. Um, all the old uh, design stuff, I, I just I had a big kick out of looking at it. Um, the stuff like this. Um, this was a piece shown at the Cleveland Museum of Art May show in 19, geez, 77, I guess. And uh, one of my great memories um, is John Moore coming up to me and saying, how am I gonna clean that? <laughs> which, which began a long friendship. Um, but uh, I had forgotten all about that until I picked up the slide and looked at it. And now, now I, have it on, I have it, it's digitized. It's, um, There's another one of um, an installation and a series of big drawings at the City Gallery in Raleigh. Um, you know, if these new technologies hadn't emerged and if people weren't so generous about uh, helping me, I mean, I'm operating with my daughter's Photoshop. I'm operating with my friend photographer scanner, my daughter and son-in-law bought me a, 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 a slide viewer. I bought, um, you know, the cleaning fluid. Um, and I'm, I'm still at it. I thought, you know, I thought I was ready a month ago, but I still got a lot of work to do. I mean, there's just, and then this is an, this, this one, this is an example of how things are done now. Right. This is from the 40 year uh, show at Spaces and they had professional photographers. I want to say the gentleman's name is Mann. I, I, I like to credit photographers. You know that, Jim. Um, but he they documented this piece extensively. Um, because it's, you know, it's. Um, uh, it's time based. So it, it has all kinds of permutations. And um, it's just beautiful. And they sent me, you know, a, a disc with all the, you know, three sets of files, three size files. You know, that's a, can you imagine? I mean, I don't even think I, I, I haven't approached CMOCA, but I, I don't know that they even photographed that stuff in 1990. I don't know. Maybe they did. I don't know. Nobody sent me any photographs of it. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of um, material, whether it's salvageable or uh, workable. Um, it's not this is a drawing uh, that i made at kent it's a big drawing on a uh, very light roofing paper like sheathing paper um like a wall wrap and it's gone it's i don't know where it's been destroyed probably been eaten by bugs out in madison county but i have a slide of i have a digital representation of it and I, 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 if you'd have asked me six months ago, uh, did I have that? I said, no, nah, I don't think so. Not sure, but I don't think so. Um, stuff like this. Um, when I, I did all these uh, leaf blower paintings and I had gotten a bunch of paper from uh, a... Uh, waste paper place it was milk carton paper and kind of heavily buffed and I sized it I ripped it all into different size pieces and I just bought a leaf blower and I've been messing around it's like 
looks like this a la Hunter Biden thing now. You know, he's I was doing a straw before Hunter Biden was, I'll tell you that. Um, but I was blowing stuff around with a straw. And then I decided, well, a leaf blower would be a lot of fun. So I spent a couple of months working, making a ton of these. Um, and, you know, uh, people love them, but they're mostly kind of wrapped up, you know. Uh, and then move on to something else. So documenting it, I think, is really is really important. How far you go back, I don't know. I um, the further I, the further I go back, the more I learn. Frankly, yeah. I I mean I um, I uh, that earlier stuff, that high school stuff, like first year art school stuff. Um, it was really a revelation to me. And it's uncomfortable to share it, but I think it's also important to share it. Um, this, is, this is an image of an envelope for a piece of mail art. This, what I was sort of preoccupied when I first got to Asheville in 79, uh, communicating with Craig Lucas and Tom Little um, with collages in the mail. And this would be an envelope to hold that stuff. Um, and I, you know, I've been trying actually um, look for his stuff because she probably is in possession of a lot of that stuff. Um, but it's a woodcut. Um, that I did at Zygote. Um, and, you know, that I want to get back up there. I've got printing to do in Cleveland. Um, so I'm, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Jim. Well, no, you enough. did. You did. Yep. It's the, you know, like my mother used to said, say, You've you've made your bed now lay in it. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, well, I think if I could just quickly give my take on what you just said, um, what you learn by going back over your work can be instructive to your new work. Yeah, well, yeah, and I, I this whole digitization thing, frankly. Um, I mean, I've always been a firm believer in co building content, right? You build content. That's what, that's essentially what artists do, I think, is they, I don't know if they create content, but they generate content. And I've generated a lot of content and a lot of that content um, was put in a drawer, photographed and put in a drawer. Um, and I don't know, you know, in a practical sense, um, exhibition sounds difficult, but with new publishing techniques, a book it is kind of intriguing to me. Um, and also, also the idea of a website. I really like the idea of a website now, much more than I did, you know, before. <laughs> you know, it, it's so, um, yeah, that's the full extent of the piece at Spaces with the, uh, I don't want to get too political, but I, you know, I'm happy to see Cleveland and Bobby DiBiasio make the big move to the Guardians. <laughs> Very happy about that. I know not everybody is, but um, it had to be done. But um, at any rate, uh, you know, I, in that piece in um, for spaces, it kind of 
what what was initially proposed at Spaces would was that it would be artist run, and that it would be it would um, cater to experimentation. At that time, in the mid to late seventies in Cleveland, there were no opportunities for people to show experimental work. Um, and when I was invited to show in this 40th anniversary show, I was working on big paintings. And I said to them, I can't show big paintings at spaces. I just can't do it. Uh, it's just out of, it's just, it would just be a horrible thing to do. No matter how good the paintings are or bad paintings are. So I had to start from scratch and um, and do something different. And more importantly, do something that would generate opportunity for future work. And some people got it, most didn't. I, I've, I, I usually have a post-installation syndrome. I had it really, really bad at this one, really bad. And I, was, I would stay in their apartment installing the piece for a couple of weeks. Beautiful space, beautiful apartment. I mean, it was just a fabulous experience, but I took it, um, I took that responsibility very seriously. And so it, it, it wore on me. The more I look at it, the more I like it, the more I feel better about it. But at the time I, um, I was really struggling with hey, it. Hey, Kevin. Yes. What's the gold emblem um, below the bus that's off to the right? Oh, that's just, a, that's an ellipse. Oh. Okay. It's like a chop. Huh. It's a, it's a, a carved, um, and it references um, square zero, which was the alternative space that we had for a brief time at 38 Biltmore Avenue in Asheville. And the square zero was the, uh, was the logo and the uh, ellipse is inside. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, it's like a chop, but a, a three-dimensional chop. Um, let me see if I can, what else I can throw up here? That might be a little different. Small painting. This is an interesting print, and and, and again, it, it, it can, I, I, maybe I'll end with this because it's get it's getting really late. Um, this is a print that I made in New York with Sheila Marbane, who's no longer with us. She was sort of instrumental in in building silkscreen. Um, as a fine art and a commercial process, a fine commercial process in New York in the 60s. Um, she printed for everybody. And she hooked up with the guys at Brand X, uh, which, which was kind of premier silkscreen shop in New York. And she had this little operation going on in the back where she had a kind of a, a monoprint process whereby she used this hand up, single person hand operated big silk screen press. And people would come in and work a screen sometimes all day with oil paints. And then she would activate it with this mixture, this solvent mixture of uh, uh, wax and um, uh, solvent. And it would essentially activate the uh the oil paint so you could work it and work it in a kind of a painterly painterly way and you would print it once and then you might get a ghost out of it meaning a weaker version on the second pull well i was fascinated by that and she was a wonderful woman and i worked with her got to know her over the years and worked with her um in 90 i guess it was 96 after the fire we had a fire in Asheville in 94 Five, where um, we a lot of us lost our studios, and I spent about three months in New York. And at that time, I worked 
with a lot of different people, but with Sheila and generated a bunch of these prints. Um, and it opened up a whole different way of, um, of building color for me, layering color as opposed to butting up blocks of color next to each other. There are essentially two ways to go at it, right? You draw a matrix and you fill it in, right? You paint it in, or you just go ahead and paint it. But you also can, it, depending on the relative density of those layers, you can build color. And that's what I learned from Sheila and Tom Little more than anything. And so um, that's how, you know, you get to a point where, um, well, you can see it here. Red, yellow, blue. And, you know, the, the color mix is, is evident, maybe even more evident here. Um, but if you think back to, um, what's his name? The guy that, um, you know, the famous uh, boxing and golf illustrator, Leroy Neiman. Leroy Neiman was was you know a big a big um, promoter of silkscreen, and his his silkscreens were what I said earlier traditional blocks of color butted up against each dense opaque color butted up against each other. Well, at some point they realized that 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 had severe limitations, and they had to start to build color in order to replicate what artists wanted to do. So transparent bases were developed and different techniques were developed so that um, silkscreen, you know, now you can do almost, almost anything with it. And, you know, this print is leaning that way where the, again, it's primary colors layered over each other in translucent um, uh, washes and layers for lack of a better term. I don't, you know, that's funny that we would end on something like that. Um, anybody? This is silk screened. All the color elements on the wall are silk screened. But, you know, I'm getting like, and that's actually silk screen on glass right there at the North Carolina Museum. I did this big piece. Uh, I wish I could generate, I wish I could pop up another slide or two of that. Um, but obviously I had to clean up my act to go there, clean shaven. But I did a, a whole thing where there were these big panels up against, I'll have to, let me see if I can pull something up. Um, holy moly, I'll tell you. No, I'm not seeing anything right away, but oh, here we, here we go. Yeah, so this is in the cafe, right? Looking out onto the rooftop uh, patio thing. And so I printed on the glass, some of it's opaque, most of it is translucent, trans, almost transparent to the point where in the image of, to the left where you see my face, you can see that kind of linear matrix above my head, that's on the glass. And then there in the background are these big panels mounted on the wall that's about 90 to 100 feet away. And you're looking at those through the printed stuff on the glass. 
So that's inside the, that's like where that uh, wooden piece was about, oh, 10 years earlier, it was just over the, this little wall. Um, any further questions? It's getting to be almost four o'clock, which is, I think, our uh, sign off or the official sign off time. Um, and we just gained a, a new participant. I can't believe that. That's extraordinary. Um, again, I want to thank you all uh, for tolerating. Uh, here's, an, here's a cool one. <laughs> This is a this is above the um, above that ins installation at Simoka. I love that space. Yeah. And I don't know what they're doing. I think they tore it down, didn't they? Didn't they tear that down? Mm -hmm. It was the old Sears building. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that I, they, I don't I don't know. I don't think so. Well, it was the Cleveland. Cleveland Playhouse was at the other end. Did they take uh, it over or something? I think they took it over. Something like that. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, at, there's another example, Jim, of I'd forgotten I even had that slide. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just like I'd just forgotten. It's one of, you know, hundreds. And I, when I saw it, I thought, wow, I'm really glad I have that. I'd forgotten all about that space. And, you know, again, I, the other thing about, I'll end on this, Jim, looking back and thinking about it, what, what, what is maybe more difficult than anything is that um, all the people I was really, well, a lot of the people I was really, really close to who su really supported me and worked hard for me are now dead. Yeah. <laughs> Marjorie Talalay was one of them. She was a wonderful woman. I, she was remarkable woman and very generous and kind to me and um craig lucas uh tom little there are more but i can name those right off the top of my head and um and you know so that might be the most difficult part um but I also wanted to, I, I try my best whenever I do something like this to mention those people, talk about them, say, I mean, they don't need my help, but um, I want people to know that they helped me yeah. an awful lot, like you did. Um, at any rate, I think that's, um, that's the end of it for me, Lila. Um, are you, do you want me to... I, that, that's not at all what I was at, expecting, you know, it, they never, they never, I try, I try, I try to script and I cannot script. <laughs> that's okay, Kevin, you've done good. Right, right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, very much. Thank you everyone for joining us and- uh, Nice seeing you, Kevin. Thank you. Yes, Thank Simon, you. it was great. Thank you, Victor. Um, hopefully I will see some of you in Cleveland in a relatively near future. Looking forward to it. I, yeah, I, yeah, I hope so. And, um, you know, if you can reach out to some of those, um, well, you know, I didn't even go. It, Victor is an old friend from high school and um, Lake, at Lakewood High School, we had the uh, data task force. <laughs> this is high school. This is 10th and this is 11th and 12th grade. We had our own cards, data ta task force in high school. And we all sat in the same class at Lakewood High. It was a magnet school for basically under the guise of commercial art, right? And you got a cubicle and you spent half the day, over half the day, in that cubicle. And I worked my tail off in there, getting a portfolio together for art school. 
And Lakewood High School gave that to me. It's amazing how many people out of that class still are very vibrant in, in the, whole, the whole art scene, period. You know? Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, Minneapolis, Santa Fe, Cleveland, yeah. Asheville, we're all over. <laughs> Lakewood High School. I talk about it all the time. And, um, you know, Phyllis Fannin, Joe Ruby, Don Battaglia. Um, I could go on. Joe Ruby did an awful lot to help me get, get my act together in, in, in preparation for art school. Absolutely. Because I wasn't going unless somebody was helping me because I, we couldn't afford to pay for it. It was probably $400 a semester or something. But um, I needed the scholarship. So, you know, and they, they helped. Uh, if, unless somebody says stop now, I will just continue. <laughs> uh, well, why don't we let everyone go? And again, everyone, thank you very much. Uh, if you're so inclined, the donate button is still in the chat. We're very excited about uh, the what is happening at Art House, and uh, we couldn't do it without the support of individuals like you. So, yeah, again, please. Again, Kevin has been very generous with his time. Um, he has given this freely, so uh, even more so. Thank you. Thank you, Lila. We'll Thank you, Kevin. Soon. Good to see you. Bye, Kevin. Love you guys. Be good. <laughs>